Great authors are by no means respectable people. Better than food, man. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you, as always. Hope you're doing well. Happy October. Get that coffee. Fantastic. What's up? Beautiful, gray, rainy October day over here. The trees are beautiful. The foliage is stunning. Very nice array of all kinds of colors. I'm gonna miss this place. Anyways, good to see you. Remember, if you enjoy these reviews, like, subscriptions, and comments are very appreciated. In fact, if you'd be so kind, please let us know what you're reading for Halloween. What you got going? Anything good? Today's episode is brought to you by the Ridge Wallet. Specifically, this awesome black Damascus model. This thing is a very cool, really interesting pattern going on there. These things are fantastic. They're light, sleek, industrial. They go into your front pocket, not your back pocket. You don't sit on them. Please don't sit on them. Holds up to 12 cards plus a room for cash on the back. The durable material means that each wallet comes with a lifetime warranty. You can buy this one wallet and carry it for life. They also make excellent gifts. Very practical. Brilliant little inventions of minimalist modular design. This here is the original Damascus model, which is fantastic. I think they're both quite cool. If I were getting a gift, I would, I would like either of these. Get 10% off your order today with free worldwide shipping and returns by going to rich.com forward slash better than food and using the discount code better than food. The link is below. Thanks a bunch. Today I'm reviewing Disagreeable Tales by the French author Léon Blois, published in 1894. Almost a quarter century after the death of L'Autremont, three years after the death of Arthur Rimbaud, and three years before the birth of Georges Bataille, just to orient ourselves. So fantasy quip period, you know, Verlaine, Rimbaud, Wiesmann, all the good shit. This is another beautiful book from uh, Wakefield Press, uh, who I'm partially sponsored by in that they send me free books from time to time. And they were very kind enough to uh, send this one, which I specifically requested because I had, uh, I'd never read Leon Blois. Uh, this is my first, so thank you very much, Wakefield Press. They're terrific. I highly suggest you go check them out. Leon Blois was a French author, a Catholic, who had all the charm of a goat hair shirt. Initially, when he was younger, hating the Catholic Church, he then became a dogmatically fanatic Catholic after meeting Barbé d'Aurevilly, author of Les Diaboliques, which is a, a, a stellar film, if you haven't seen it. Uh, but I, I have not read the book, unfortunately. I haven't read any of d'Aurevilly yet. But anyways, I think he lived across the street from him, or nearby, at least. So this is a collection of gothic tales and diabolical tragedy with a pitch black sense of deranged, deep, dark humor. Sometimes it's like L'Autremont was hired by the local police precinct to write up police reports. Maldoror is in fact referenced in this collection, right? If you haven't read that, please, anybody who has not read Maldoror and L'Autremont, Isidore Ducasse, it was the nom de plume de Isidore Ducasse, please go read that. Um, stellar poet, died very young. Really, really horrid stuff. Horrid, terrible, disgusting, grotesque, perfect for Halloween. Essential reading. Favorite of David Bowie's. But then Bowie liked Mishima too. Bowie had. Exceptional literary taste. Anyways, moving on. Blois is one of the stranger literary characters I've come across. And I've, yeah, I've, I've read a bit. You gotta look this guy up too, like his thousand yard stare with this bright white, enormous Nietzschean mustache it just makes for a very iconic look. His style is outrageously hyperbolic, deliberately malicious, cranky, and occasionally just hysterical. The atmosphere is dank, dark France in the late 19th century, the France of thievery and whoring, of desperate poverty and starvation, of murder and all manner of sordid activities and exploitation. Blois's writings, taken as a whole, seem to be a monstrously cynical reaction to a disgusting world. But there is something I'd like to point out. While the blurb on the back is technically true, it is a little bit of, of um, it's misleading. It sounds sensational as marketing. Blois is, is closer to writing parables than he is to Sod, but his parables are nasty. It's like, it's like Sod converted and started writing parables. Nasty, nasty parables. Disagreeable parables. This isn't crude or vulgar writing at all. On the contrary, sometimes I'd have uh, difficulty locating myself because the writing was so verbose. Blah is in, in possession of an exceptional vocabulary. It seemed as if each story contained an outstanding but rarely used word that I'd never come across in, in literature before. I'd actually have to look them up. This doesn't happen very often, but, but in here it did. Some examples would be objurgations, opuscule, and nugatory. Nugatory indeed. Quite nugatory. Blah. It's good to have a dictionary nearby for this one. I can just smell the rancid pretension of those unsubscribers who still watch all my videos chortling at me with their trembling, hairy second chins. 
He didn't know what nugatory meant. The Cretan. <laughs> He's also a master at the art of insult. He would just talk so much shit about people. He was a, not somebody you'd want to invite to a party. His broad face looked like a baboon's hindquarters. He's always describing how ugly people's faces are. It's really quite interesting. And I find Blaw's uh, colorful similes like nothing short of genius. Behold, the bronze fiber of your implacable justice is already going slack, like a guitar, loosening its strings after 30 dogs have pissed on it. I mean, it's actually stunning. <laughs> For that line of outstanding absurdity alone, I've declared that the book is better than food. The colorful language and words employed by Blaw are just spectacular, and more than once absolutely hysterical. I mean, really, you know, scathing, but funny. He was also a friend of uh, Alfred Jerry, author of the uproarious for the time, uh, Ubu Hua. This is unsurprising. Ubu Hua was an infamous kind of a absurdist play, very punk for the time. Jerry died young of uh, tuberculosis. I imagine at that time in France, in history, a lot of people died young of tuberculosis. Of this collection of the short stories, the ones that stood out for me were The Parlor of the Tarantulas, wherein the narrator is uh, forced to withstand the god-awful orations of a, a mediocre poet from dusk till dawn and, and then some, I think. Unable to escape, I, I believe if I remember properly, at gunpoint. So, on the back of the description of the book, 30 tales of theft, onanism, incest, murder, and a host of other forms of perversion and cruelty from the ungrateful beggar and pilgrim of the absolute Leon Blois. Onanism, onanism, like masturbation, right? Well, this would be the story I believe they're referring to, Unless I'm mistaken, unless I miss something, which is, which is, I feel for the average reader, kind of easy to do in this one because the language is so, you know, it's fantasy -less, so it's like, it's verbose. It means masturbation, but it can also mean like um, self-gratification, intellectual self-gratification. The way Blah describes his poet in the story is funny because it sounds like he's, <laughs> he doesn't use the word ejaculatory, but these, you know, orations, these self-gratifying orations, I think there's a joke going on here. He's calling this poet masturbatory, and I think he's calling a lot of poets masturbatory, but that's, that's my opinion. I don't know for sure. I couldn't find much on it, actually. I think he's describing him as like a chronic masturbator, but I think the crux of the story is he's making it difficult to tell whether he's talking about the man's poetry or the good old-fashioned thing. Anyways, and the incest is, is a mistake. In, in the story. It's not, it's neither known by the parties or, uh, or consensual necessarily. So it's, uh, it's, it's more of like, um, uh, kind of like a hideous tragic trap. This description makes it sound like he's sad. He's, he's not. The Prisoners of Lojumeau uh, is a, uh, is a short story that reminded me of a, of a darker version of, uh, Louis Bunuel's film, The Exterminating Angel, the bourgeoisie who can't leave the room. The short story is about this couple who are unable Physically unable for reasons beyond their knowledge, I think I read later after I finished the story that it was like demonic possession of a sort, to arrive anywhere on time. They can't even leave their town. They're just unable to get anywhere, and they don't know why. Jocasta in the Streets was one about a man who was sort of tormented from birth by various things uh, in life. One was the death of his mother, supposedly. His father is, is horribly abusive, a total, completely tyrannical, awful human being who the son suspects is actually trying to kill him at some points, it seems. But eventually, as the son grows older, he goes and he sleeps with a prostitute who knows something about the death of his mother. Whatever You Want, the title of another story, is kind of almost a um, variation on a theme to, to the previous one I mentioned, with a death uh, seemingly, actually, inspired by Pierre Curie, as a matter of fact. More on Curie later. A Dentist's Terrible Punishment is about a, a dentist who kills his competitor for the, for the heart of this woman, who he's in love with, so he can marry her. Then, already feeling guilt for that crime, the dentist has a child with her that resembles the man he killed. Uh, so yeah, echoes of Poe here. Like, telltale heart, black cat, well done, which is, a, which is an awful pun. <laughs> is about the hideous actions of an heir during the death of his father. Features a kind of a premature cremation, hence the titular pun. More echoes of Poe, definitely, who had the theme of uh, premature burials. It's Gonna Blow is about the horrific confession of a seeming gentle old soul. And the final story, Cain's Luckiest Find, features Blois' alter ego, Cain Marché Noir. And the ending kind of foreshadows the infamous ending to uh, David Fincher's Seven. Qui a dans la boîte, Monsieur Marché Noir? I've linked to a couple resources for this review below. In particular, Eric Morse's review in the Paris Review served as a big help to this review. So I highly suggest you check that out. I highly recommend it. Excellent work. Link below. So after becoming Catholic, after uh, changing his views, uh, Blois lived in poverty, mooching off of his friends and acquaintances, probably destroying his relationships. Sounds like two of his children died from it, potentially. Blois became known as the ungrateful beggar. It seems he thought it the more Christian modus operandi. And he's written, 
Woe to him who has not begged, he writes. There is nothing greater than begging. God begs, the angels beg, the dead beg, all that is in light and glory begs. That's from the Morse Review. So famously in 2013, uh, Pope Francis actually quoted Blois by saying, uh, when one does not profess Jesus Christ, I recall the phrase of Leon Blois, whoever does not pray to God, prays to the devil. I really don't know if Blois is to be admired on that level. I don't admire him on that level. But then the Catholic Church is the Catholic Church. It's interesting though. Blois was very smart without question, but he's the result of abuse and poverty and starvation and misery upon misery upon misery. He's not, you know, the Catholics may want to assimilate him as a martyr, but whatever, like I'm not buying it. Blois attacked people who he felt deserved it with a, like a straight razor of a mind. It seems he detested technology, but most of all, he hated wealthy people and women. He was an absolute misogynist and I do not use that word lightly. He is the shining clearest example. I mean, my God, women do not fare well in his stories, I have to warn you. And the Paris Review article refers to it as his thorny salvation misogyny, which seems completely accurate to me. That's definitely present, so fair warning. This sort of condescension pervasive in his writings. But you know, if that's all it was, of course, we wouldn't be reading him. Misogyny is unfortunately something that kind of comes with the territory of fantasy literature. I was actually just reading um, the introduction to Against Nature by Louise Maul, uh, one time friend of Blois and uh, all the, the, the better author in my opinion. But uh, yeah, this uh, uh, Against Nature, I'm gonna re-review it sometime soon. And uh, Patrick McGinnis who wrote the, uh, the, the introduction was talking about that. It's kind of something that shouldn't be refined away because it was very much a part of that milieu, right? That was very much the tone of the era over in France. So you gotta take the bad with the good. But as we see here again, Blois is a perfect example. Great authors are by no means respectable people, but they are fascinating. So don't feel bad if you enjoy books by people who may have been atrocious. I think that distinction needs to be made and can't be uh, reaffirmed enough. Unsavory characters can write amazing books. Cancel culture will never eliminate that truth. At best, it will only temporarily conceal it. I'd wager he wouldn't do too well in today's era either, but then he was also a misfit in his own era. And I learned that word was used to describe him by others as well, uh, specifically Alan Morris, this Catholic preacher who wrote, he has been likened to a prophet of ancient Israel, an apologete of the second century and a medievalist. Thus, he was apparently a misfit in the 20th century. Morris later goes on in the same piece to say that Blah was not a religious fanatic. To that, I will merely reply, au contraire, mon frere. Blois calls himself a voluntary fanatic in his own introduction to the book. I mean, I just, I just can't take that shit seriously. There is something medieval about Blois. You know, he's writing about these characters like suffering in, in uh, 19th century France, but then, you know, on the next page, you get this tone where you're like expecting uh, like medieval torture or like reading about like, you know, the four humors, Catholic mortification and shit, you know? But Blois also said that uh, priests are latrines. They are there for humanity to pour out our filth. Wow. His language and ideas are erudite. My wife heard me speak in my sleep the other night. I never do this apparently, but I, I specifically, she woke, she was woken up when I just said this. Excellent choice of words, erudite. I never use that word. It, I, I, I'm, I'm not even comfortable with, the, with my, my knowledge at the time, the definition of erudite, but you know, apparently my subconscious knows the, the meaning better than I do. Uh, and apparently I'm saying things like that in my sleep. <laughs> It's not fucking weird. <laughs> so his language and ideas are erudite, but uh, there is something coarse about Blois, something filled with vinegar, something brackish, mentally unstable, ill, repugnant, and kind of genius. Actually, I'll just put it this way. This man is fueled by hatred, contempt, vitriol, projectile vomiting out con the contaminated blood of hatred on the world, on, on, on just everybody, like those, like those fast zombies from 28 Days Later. That is the best image I can think of for the writing of Leon Blois. Not all these like apologetic Catholics talking about how he was really a, deep, a good guy deep down. Get the f come on, man. I mean, listen to this. This is from uh, uh, the story, It's Gonna Blow, when, when we're, we're discovering the crime of this uh, gentle old soul. And this is right before he reveals what he did. But he said, at the same time, something laid hold of me, something better it seemed than stuffing my guts. I was glutted, drunk, and refreshed by the delectable wine of hatred and vengeance. Refreshed is in italics. That's Blois. That, that's him writing about himself. That is Leon Blois. 
a man refreshed by the wine of hatred and vengeance. Leon Blois is like um, taking his revenge in a moralistic way on the world. It seems indisputable to me, but this is my first one. I don't know anything, so leave your comment below if you know better. Blois is what I would imagine Arthur Rimbaud to be, like to grow up to be, if he had come back from Africa and not died of cancer and had still been unable to make money, which was his focus later in life after he stopped writing poetry. It never worked for him. He tried so many, he was an arms dealer, he was a um, coffee trader. Uh, historically one of the first in a certain area of Africa. Incredible. If he came back from Africa to France and was still unable to make money and had converted into a fervent Catholic, that's what Léon Blois seems like to me. He seems like the logical end of Rimbaud. Blois actually knew Verlaine, you know, Paul Verlaine, who Rimbaud had an affair with and then was shot by. But Blois is a mystery to me. He's a contradiction, like so many of these guys. And, and it's just endlessly fascinating. I mean, you could just... There's, there's so much material, so, so much mystery, and it's, it's compelling that I don't understand him at all, but I want to know more. There's a lot going on here. And Blois influenced a wide range of authors, from Kafka to Louis Ferdinand Céline to Jorge Luis Borges and Flannery O'Connor and Ernst Jünger, and I assume many, many more. Till this one, you know, I hadn't had the pleasure. Also, Blois is not a surrealist or proto-surrealist, as uh, Morse points out. Blois's style is base and of the gutter, uh, a negative theology, as he puts it. In fact, he goes on to make a comparison to a couple texts by one of my favorite authors, Georges Bataille, those being Ma Mère, my mother, and uh, The Dead Man, as well as Jean Genet's A Thief's Journal, which I haven't read, but I did read Our Lady of the Flowers, and that was, I assume that's actually pretty similar. That book is disgusting. <laughs> Genet is disgusting, but he's a great writer. I imagine it's similar. But all of those texts, of course, came decades after Blois. Morse says, For Blois, all physical pleasures are diversion, or worse yet, satanic temptation. So it is only through intense suffering and punishment that his characters can expiate their sins. And after all, and Morse cites it, Kafka said, His is fire nurtured by the dung heap of modern times. This era of literary history is just filled with all of these very strong characters and individuals. So interesting. Blois was filled with venomous piety. I mean like Old Testament God's vengeance on the modern world. He would have welcomed another flood. He would have been the guy who writes the op-ed that gets approved, God knows how, in the New York Times in tears of joy praising God for the coronavirus. That's what Blois would have been doing now. Uh, the guy was a troll, man. <laughs> There's no other way to describe him. He was an odious character. He was a Christian zealot and cherished the idea of being a social parasite as a holy modus operandi. I mean, he was apparently, this actually happened, he was apparently publicly cheering for the sinking of the Titanic, a fire at the opera, and the death of the French physicist, uh, Pierre Curie, who won the Nobel Prize and was crushed by a, 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 a horse-drawn carriage. The man just gives off, he's a fucking troll. He's like a French decadent Yosemite Sam. I mean, he is fascinating, but he's fascinating in the way of just watching somebody explode, like just watching somebody who's absolutely almost like possessed, kind of like self-destructing and lashing out at the world around them, though a genius they clearly are. You can definitely see Flannery O'Connor enjoying this guy. For those, for those of you who haven't read A Good Man is Hard to Find, I highly suggest you go check that out ASAP. Ernst Jünger was a surprise. That was, that was interesting. Blas' fixation with prostitutes was interesting, and then I learned that his wife was actually a former prostitute and uh, ended up in the psychiatric hospital. Uh, anybody who married Blas would probably end up in the same place, and it would be understandable. Wiesmann and Blas were friends, but then had a falling out over what I don't know, but I, is anybody surprised? It's a book filled in part with stuffy French fantasy classicness. If this sounds like your thing, or it could be your thing, you're gonna love it. But in my opinion, Wiesmann was a better author. So I would say Against Nature and Laba. And in Laba, he actually caricatures Blois, which may have led to their falling out, I'm not sure. He has all the charm of a three-month-old roadkill, but he is a very good author. I suspect it came from all the pain and strife. You know, I mean, we are at our best, I think, probably when we are pushed to the fucking brink. And this guy was. Put himself in some very stressful places. So, I wouldn't be surprised if that had something to do with forging his, his, his talent. So better than food? I give a cautious yes. Better than food. But I feel like I could go either way. He's not as good as Wiesmont, but there are some great lines in here, and I think there's more to be discovered. Some of these lines are just excellent, you know, and I love his wit and style. I would definitely give it a reread. Cool? Cool. <sighs> Coffee time.
For those of you who are new, I take all the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video. I place their names in this mason jar. I pull out a name for every review I do, and whoever's name I pull out, I send them a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee roasted by yours truly. And the coffee is delicious. And those who are donating will get the chance to win a bag of coffee that uh, I roasted, which is from China, from the Yunnan province. And it's the best coffee I've ever tasted. And there are only a few days left to get in on that. So if you would like to have that chance, well, now's your chance. If you donate a dollar or more, you'll get access to all the things listed below, and I sincerely appreciate it. Thank you very much to all the patrons, and best of luck. Okay, here we go. Brian, Brian W. Thank you very much, Brian. You're going to receive Disagreeable Tales by Leon Blois, and some delicious coffee from China, and I hope you love both. Thank you so much for your support, and happy Halloween. All right, well, that's all I've got for you today. And for all the patrons, I gotta tell you, there's something really interesting coming along on Halloween, so you don't wanna miss it. Or maybe you do, we'll see. <laughs> well, please subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this, and always remember, die reading. Take care of yourselves, happy Halloween, talk to you soon. Ciao.